Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dorsey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the Norbanism division. And I'm your webcast moderator. Today is January 19th, and we will be hearing the presentation Enhancing Social Engagement to Achieve Sustainability in Transportation Planning. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call that 1-800 number that's shown. For your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box again, located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Soon, we will have a list of our sponsors for 2018. They're coming in fast and furious, so probably by our next webcast, you'll see a great big list of everyone that has joined us again this year. Um, today's webcast in particular is sponsored jointly by the Sustainable Communities Division and the Technology Division. So we thank both of them um, for putting on today's webcast. And you can learn about them and all of our divisions at planning.org slash divisions. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by visiting our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And we do have several um, in the works um, for the beginning of February and into March. So make sure that you uh, stay tuned and check back because those are going to be filling up quickly. To log your CM credits for attending today's session, just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and then you can search for CM activities up at the top. And you can do that either by typing in the title of today's webcast or the event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We uh, do have some recorded webcasts that will be available for distance education. We're just getting those submitted now for 2018. We'll have one law and one ethics. Um, so check back again to our webcast webpage for details on that. Um, hopefully in the next week or two, we'll have those up and ready to go. Um, and like us on Facebook, planning webcast series to receive up-to-date information on all the things that, that I've mentioned previously. And we are recording today's webcast. It'll be available after the session on our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and type in planning webcast. And we'll also have a PDF available for download at the end of the session. Just head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast and um, you can download it there. Um, I'm now going to go ahead and turn it over to Jenny of the Sustainable Communities Division, who's going to kick us off and get us started. Jenny. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> so as Christine said, uh, my name is Jenny Koch, and I'm a senior associate uh, urban planner with Roadside and Harwell in Alexandria, Virginia. But today I'm representing the Sustainable Communities Division, which, as she mentioned, is one of the hosts for today's webinar. Uh, just so you know, in case you don't already, uh, the ABA Sustainable Communities Division supports planners who are committed to planning for sustainable communities by integrating all aspects of sustainability into our work through the combined economic, social, and ecological factors that shape our communities. Uh, as always, we, we want to acknowledge our uh, Sustainable Communities Division sponsors. So thank you to these organizations who help us put on events such as this webinar and, and all of our events throughout the year. Uh, our sponsors this year include Clarion, Dewberry, Far Associates, Hess, Niche Engineering, Robinson & Cole, Smith Group JJR, U.S. Green Building Council, CDP Engineers, Montgomery Associates, Tesca, and TransformativeTools.org. So thank you to our sponsors and to all of our division members who also contribute to support our work. Uh, we love partnering with the Planning Webcast series for education events, but we also host and co-host many of our own, so we want to make sure you knew about some of our upcoming events, which are listed here. Uh, we have two more webinars planned already for 2018 in February, and we've uh, planned a training that we'll co-host with eco-districts uh, around uh, 
the time of the National Planning Conference in New Orleans. So you can see sustainableplanning.net for more information and to register for those events. Uh, you can also contact us uh, using our website, blog, LinkedIn, other social media uh, if you're interested in volunteering or if you have other ideas for webinars or other activities. We'd love to hear from you. So to get to today's event, uh, as Christine said, uh, the topic of today is enhancing social engagement to achieve sustainability in transportation planning. And we'll have three speakers. I do want to note we were supposed to have a fourth speaker, uh, Jenna Linett, but she is unfortunately sick today, so is unable to be here. Uh, but our three speakers that we do have are Mary Mohibi, Angela Vanderkloof, and Nader Avslan. Uh, Mary will be speaking first, and I'll give you a short bio for her, and I'll introduce our other speakers a little bit later. Uh, Mary Bohibi, who uh, I want to give a quick shout out to organize the speakers and the webinar today, uh, is a senior urban planner and social sustainability strategist at Planning Communities. She's also a PhD candidate at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. Uh, she has academic background in architectural design and urban sociology, and over 10 years of professional experience in the Middle East and Europe, from serving as the National Delegate, delegate of ISACARP uh, to working as a board member for the City Image Committee at Sunman City Council. Her research and practice mainly focuses on social disparities in urban America. During the last six years, she has focused on urban accessibility issues Muslim minorities face in the Detroit metro area. And uh, her work has been internationally presented at academic and professional conferences. So we're very excited to have her and other speakers today. And I will uh, pass it off to Mary to get started. Mary, I think you are muted. I do apologize. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being with us. Today's discussion focuses on tools Hi, and techniques. Sorry. To I also have to interrupt as well. Could you please go up to display settings and hit duplicate slide? So it does seem that hmm. I cannot do that. Hmm. Okay, could you just um, close down from presentation mode and try one more time? Perfect, you're good to go. Oh. Okay, okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, I do apologize. Thank you very much, Jennifer and Christine. Hello everyone, and thank you for being with us. Today's discussion focuses on tools and techniques we planners can use to enhance social engagement in planning practice. And me and my colleagues will look at this from different angles. As we all learn during our education and practices, enhancing social engagement is the key to meet all stakeholders' needs when we are working with a community. However, like uh, right now in real world, the budget that normally considered for community engagement in planning project do not support extensive effort needed to access a diverse group of people. Even like in cases that there is enough budget and time to define uh, public participation as a significant phase of a project, our knowledge is limited to identify social and cultural groups who should get involved in the process. So you can see there are so many obstacles and questions which should be addressed from our perception of public engagement to methods we normally use in this critical phase of planning practices. Like we use terms like LEP, limited English proficiency. We try to generalize some characteristic for such social groups, but our years of experience working with underrepresented population shows that they cannot be considered such under such homogeneous social identity. For LEP, as an instance, there is a percentage that should be satisfied. Otherwise, a group uh, with limited English proficiency would not be properly considered in the planning process in, in transportation project specifically. Uh, do these numbers work? And how can we maximize our, our outreach to LEP population without considering such criteria? These are questions that we all ask all the time when we are working with multi, within multicultural social setting with a considerable presence of people with limited English proficiency. 
And the term LEP is only one example, and I am sure that every one of you can find many examples from your experiences of such generalization, which ignores extraordinary diversity among underrepresented population. And on the other hand, we mainly use old-fashioned and dysfunctional public involvement techniques such as canvassing and traditional types of public meetings. You might attend the public meetings with almost no participant. I did it. Or one with only a white population involved in an area where a considerable numbers of minorities live in. This all hints to uh, public meeting and many other traditional engagement methods as tools to not increase but decrease social inclusion. So, as a as a as a finding, techniques that we use to invite underrepresented population to planning processes should align with socioeconomic and cultural characteristic of such a population. So, to start the conversation, the community that I've worked with them in the last five years is considered as underrepresented population due to numerous social political issues they face in urban America. And I'm talking about Muslim community. Before opening a conversation about my community, it is essential to know that beside race, ethnicity, and gender, religion also plays as a driver for margin marginalization within urban society. The irony is that religion is not considered as a critical factor in planning processes at the same level of race, ethnicity, and gender. I'm sure you read numerous case studies, or you might work on several projects addressing racial and ethnic minorities' needs, or you might get a chance to address gender-based issues in your professional life, but I assume you barely work with religious minorities and consider religion as a factor which can push a community to the margin. In case of the community that I have worked with in the last five years, due to social political situation and cultural factors and many other factors, um, Muslim community in the United States lost their trust in any outsider, including researchers and planners. Such a situation defined this community like as a hard to reach population. And we as planners or scholars in planning field need to have an insightful perspective of Muslim community to work with them as one of the most ignored communities within urban America. And in working with Muslim minority during the last five years, I learned that first, we should have a comprehensive perspective of the role religious values play in their daily social life. And second, we need to communicate with cultural diversity among Muslim minorities. And these two factors, understanding religious values and understanding the diversity within Muslim community help us to have access to Muslim community and promote the quality of contact that we have with them. The graph that you can see in this slide just shows the extraordinary diversity among Muslim community based on racial ethnic breakdown. This graph tried to make a comparison between different religious groups in the United States and say that how they are diverse based on the racial ethnic breakdown. And there are so many other factors that, that can add to this diversity in case of Muslim community, like their country of origin, like their sect of Islam, and other things that can affect their social life. So why the quality of contact is important when you're working with a minority group? So quality of contact is important because it really helps us to identify group-based factors which are invisible to an outsider. If you're not an insider, it's really hard to understand so many things that impact and influence the social life equation for so many minority groups within urban America and also other Western cities. You need to change your position from an outsider to an insider in so many cases to be able to communicate with group-based factors. And these factors are very different and from one group to another group. For instance, when we are working with Hispanic population, we face a different set of group-based factors than when we are working with Muslim community. Like in case of Hispanic population, my experience shows that their immigration status sometimes makes them feel uncomfortable and avoid participating in public meetings. After a public meeting, you may receive comments like you, what you can see in this slide, which shows their feeling of not being counted or considered by governmental entities. 
which is saying this this comment that I saw it in several comment forms says that no es importante lo que decimos as en lo que quieren hacer. It means that it doesn't matter what we are saying, they will do whatever they want to do. And on the other hand, you uh, Muslims as another minority group, they face a different set of issues within urban America, which rooted in their feeling of being under tight security and also public eyes misconception about this minority group. So why understanding these factors is, is essential for an urban planner? Failure to identify factors that push these minority groups to the margin result in failure to have them involved in planning practices. And it is the reason why the quality of contact is important. And understanding the group-based um, characteristic helps us to first choose techniques which makes those group feel comfortable to, to participate in the process of social engagement. Second, choose places for communication and meetings which is convenient for, more for them and maximize their participation. And third, choose the language which is more understandable for such groups. And at the end, considering time and budget which fits such a third. So what we, we see normally in real world and in our practices is that we use similar techniques, similar phrases, and we use um, similar, I mean, we consider similar times and budget for uh, having social engagement phase in planning practices, which is, which is not going to work if we continue in this way without considering other factors which can uh, help and invite and motivate minority groups to participate in social engagement processes. In the project that um, I have done in the last five years, and um, the first phase was to build a relationship of trust with Muslims and have a quality contact with them. For such um, effort, um, the three main steps were taken. We first lived a local life through informal connections in public spaces, specifically in mosques. And then we had several participant observation in public spaces. And then we tried to connect um, and participate in local govern governing organization meetings and activities and to understand. And so, that, so these three steps helped us to discover the meaning of truthfulness in, Mos in a Muslim's perspective and then to understand that how effective are Muslims' voice in policymaking processes in Southeast Michigan. Taking those time-consuming steps it resulted in gaining trust and kind of maximize Muslim communities' engagement in planning practice. And what we did here mainly is used in ethnographic studies. However, we used these techniques in a project related to active transportation planning. So our intention was to understand that um, what kind of social and cultural factors prevent Muslim women from walking in urban trail and urban neighborhoods. As we were not trusted in the first glance by in Muslims' eye, we should find a way to understand their social habits and communicate with them to enhance their participation in the process of the project. And then this step kind of made us to uh, have a perspective closer to an insider perspective. The photo that you see in this in this slide shows few of numerous ceremonies, rituals, local meetings that we participated during the last five years of working with uh, Muslim community in Southeast Michigan. So this long-term interaction with Muslim community and local governing sectors helped us to understand the uh, hierarchy of working needs for Muslim women, which is considerably different from known models of walking behavior. In the new model that we found out, which is ap applicable to Muslim women walking behavior, fear of others decreases the likelihood of walking in their own neighborhood or near nearby uh, urban trails. And surprisingly, the built environment component were mentioned as the least influential factor influencing Muslim women walking behavior. So as you can see, based on the graph that I'm showing here and the order of the influential factor um, on Muslim women decision making related to, the, to their walking behavior, Muslim women religious affiliation and public eyes image of them has tremendously diminished their walking experiences, which is a part of social experience every one of us have every day. You can see that the order of the influential factors under walking behavior is the first first of all is fear of others 
which has subcategories as microaggression, social segregation, public misconception about Muslim community. The second influential factor was cultural differences with non-Muslims, which has subcategories of social illiteracy about Muslims, social mistrust between Muslims and non-Muslims, and lack of equal treatment within the community. And the next one is social acceptance within Muslim community. And the last one, and the least important one, was the built environment component and public life. So beside understanding significance of considering religion as an influential factor to promote um, social engagement and the value of trust in planning pro practices. This project addressing Muslim women needs related to their walking behavior directed us to the following consideration for future policy making in urban America to overcome the barriers that Muslim community face and specifically Muslim women face to enjoy urban life and walking is an instance of it. We found out that we need to enforce policies combating residential segregation. It's not a new finding. We have, we have had so many studies and projects focusing on black population having the same result. And then uh, we find out that we should make citizen groups through interfaith activities. We should promote intergroup interaction but by initiating neighborhood level community activities led by residents themselves. And at the end, we should motivate Muslim youth to act as social engagement ambassadors within their community. And these four findings can be used by any planner in, in projects addressing Muslim needs in urban America. And I assume it could be applicable by a few changes in other Western contexts. This short presentation was a tiny part of a long-term planning process um, for Muslim community and defining of this attempt will be will be available soon. Um, I think I'm, I'm kind of short in time. I just would like to thank you for your attention and I will be delighted to answer a question at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. By this, I will pass it to Jennifer uh, for introducing our next panelist. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. You can actually just pass the screen directly to Angela. Sure. And I'll, um, I'll just do a brief introduction to Angela while she's pulling up her slides. Uh, Angela Vanderkloof is an enthusiastic project manager, speaker, and trainer with 25 years of experience. She specializes in bicycle planning, education, and engagement, and development in electric bicycling. Since 2008, she has worked as a consultant for Movicon, a Dutch independent research and consulting company focused on traffic, mobility, and transport. Prior to this, Angela was a project coordinator for several NGOs, during which she initiated and developed several innovative projects. She currently combines her job with an external PhD position at Redbound University, in which she researches the passing on of cycling knowledge from parents and within schools to children in the Netherlands. So Angela, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, and thank you for the introduction. Um, in my presentation, I am taking you uh, from North America to the Netherlands, and I will talk about bicycle lessons for immigrants and refugees. Um, and actually, I started to teach women to ride bikes back in 1991, when I was a student in human geography. And in my current work as a consultant and as a PhD student, I still value and use many of the lessons that I learned through teaching women to ride bikes. And I continue to advocate for good quality bicycle lessons in each city Definitely in the Netherlands, um, but I think there's also opportunities in other countries uh, in the world. Okay, next slide. Yeah. Um, so, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, a specific social phenomenon was happening in the Netherlands, so-called guest workers from Mediterranean countries, like Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey, and Morocco, they were um, allowed to settle in our country with their families. And in the same period, groups of people from Suriname in Latin America came to live in the Netherlands, as the country was then no longer a Dutch colony, and people could choose to come and live here in the Netherlands. Many of these migrants had had little or no education, and efforts were taken to set up centers of support for these migrant families. 
One such initiative was the Center for Migrant Women in my city, Tilburg, in the south of the Netherlands. And over the years, this center specialized in setting up activities and support for migrant and refugee women and families, and many of them with a Muslim background. The aim was to offer a meeting space with courses and activities that strengthen women's position uh, in their families and also in society. Participation in society and em emancipation is seen as a two-step approach. First, the internal emancipation in your own family and community uh, by sharing experiences, feeling that you're not the only one facing challenges and giving each other support. And secondly, the external emancipation, the strengthening the position in society towards uh, full participation. These types of community centers over the years have had a lot of support from a broad range of, of people and organizations in Dutch society, although there are also people who are very much against support for migrants and refugees, as you maybe sometimes see in current news. In the picture, you see our Queen Maxima, the bright blonde woman in the middle, and she was then still a princess uh, visiting our center uh, in my city. And she strongly supports these initiatives, which shows um, that there is also important role models who support initiatives happening there. So the type of activities and courses offered varies. And examples are language courses, sewing lessons, support in job search, and also bicycle lessons. In the Netherlands, hundreds of community centers offer these courses. Um, the bicycle lessons, or you could say the bike school that I developed in Tilburg over the years, um, informally and organically became a standard for how to teach adults to ride bikes and how to use bikes. So why is it that bicycle lessons are offered at so many places in the Netherlands and for so many years? Basically, it's a combination of several factors. Being born a woman in many countries means that you will not learn to ride a bicycle or you will not learn to use it in daily life properly. In the Netherlands, it makes absolute sense to use the bicycle uh, as a means of transportation and also to do your shopping to, and to transport your children. Women who were participants in language courses and sewing courses started to ask for bicycle lessons and had conversations about it. And there were people in these centers who picked up this demand and started to organize the courses. With this in mind, it is clear that for many, the aim of the bicycle lessons was not just to learn to being able to ride in a circuit in a park, but to actually learn to use the bicycle in city traffic. Starting to teach adults to ride bikes has been a great adventure for me and, and many others involved in this in the Netherlands. Most Dutch children are taught to ride bikes by their parents or other relatives, and hardly any native Dutch adult needs to learn to ride a bicycle. This means that experimenting and collaborative learning styles were needed in order to create a method and find the right approach and materials. The words step-by-step step and courage summarize important elements. Other important elements are taking time, creating a safe space and being open-minded. By not assuming anything, by starting from absolute scratch when needed. You support the learners to open up themselves for the learning experience and encourage them to take ownership of their own learning process. It is their process and not the process of the trainers, of the teachers. The, the role of the teachers is to facilitate, to encourage, to offer a shoulder to cry on when that is needed, and an opportunity to laugh and enjoy together. Starting from scratch may sound easy, but when you are, like many Dutch adults are, unconscious, competent cyclists, this is the most difficult thing to learn when you start to teach others to ride. You need to become aware of what you know and which skills you have before you can transfer them to others. Um, 
Well, and if you're interested to learn more uh, specifics on this, I can recommend you to read the book chapter that is in the last slide uh, in this presentation. So the step-by-step -step approach builds on the start from scratch idea. And each tiny step learned is a reason to celebrate, which is very important when you learn something and, and uh, encourages you to move on. Bicycle lessons are aimed at um, educating people to use the bicycle safely in daily life in Dutch traffic. So more is needed than just focusing on balancing skills and riding around. There is also a need to teach the rules of the road for cyclists, like you can see in the left uh, picture. Um, you know, with attractive teaching material uh, that is very interactive, it is possible to learn the rules of the road for people who come from countries where it is absolute, you know, for, in a Dutch opinion, absolute chaos in traffic. And the rules of the road for cyclists in the Netherlands are not the same uh, as in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, other country. There's quite a lot of things to be learned. Um, it is also important to being informed about types of bicycles and advantages of different types of bikes. Since many participants of the courses are women with young children, it is also um, important to stimulate them to ride the bicycle with the children and do this by practicing this together and sharing information on child seats and also on how to carry a child and also your shopping uh, on a bicycle. And to give, you, to give you an example of, again, the step-by-step -step approach, uh, we train women to ride with children in a little seat in the back of the bicycle by not straight away putting the child in the seat, but maybe a big bag of potatoes or something heavy. You put it in the little seat and you, you, you start to learn riding with that so that you get used to having some weight uh, on the back rack. The reason that it is so important to include learning practices on cycling with children is related to the Dutch context. The overall bicycle model share for all ages is 27%. For children up to 15 years old, it is 39%. And the walking mode share for children is 24%. Immigrant and refugee children who do not learn to cycle will have less access and opportunities compared to their native Dutch peers. And this does play a role uh, in school activities or after school activities. So what are the effects of the bicycle lessons? There is not much research on the effect of bicycle lessons. The centers where these activities take place, they struggle to find funding for bicycles and other course materials. And there are always waiting lists with new people who want to learn to ride. So although many people support the initiatives like this uh, in, uh, with mental support, it is hard to find real support in terms of euros or researchers that are really interested to pick up the topic. It is only recently, even generally, that cycling research in the Netherlands is looking into the social domain. Um, so it has not been easy um, to get facts and figures in a uh, structured way. My educated guess is that each year around 6,000 women learn to cycle. Um, which percentage then actually starts to use the bicycle in daily life? I do not know exactly. Uh, I know from experience that over 50% of the women we taught in my city picked up cycling in one way or another. In the few surveys and researches that are done, other effects are mentioned, and um, everyone mentions that these are uh, very important effects for the women themselves. They feel more healthy, they make new friends, they have more self-esteem, uh, feel more independent, have a better understanding of traffic rules, and gain skills to raise their children with cycling and traffic safety skills, which they find important uh, since they live here in the Netherlands. Um, 
we can also look at the try to look at the effects in another way by looking at some numbers. So the numbers of men and women cycling in the Netherlands um, overall for the population, if there are 10 bike trips, four and a half are done by males and five and a half by females. Uh, but men on average cycle 1.2 times the distance that women cycle and it is three kilometers per day on average. If we look at first and second generation inhabitants with a non-Western background in the Netherlands, of the 10 bike trips made, five and a half are done by males and four and a half by females. Um, per year, women with a non-Western background on average cycle almost 700 kilometers in 180 trips. And if we compare this with women in the UK, um, which is you know a country just overseas from the Netherlands, on average they cycle 33 kilometers per year in nine bike, bike trips. So all in all, women with a non-Western background who live in the Netherlands cycle on average 20 times more than the average woman in the UK. Now, this webinar uh, the topic is enhancing social engagement to achieve sustainable mobility or in transportation planning. So how do bicycle lessons in the Netherlands contribute to that? And how is that social engagement? To cycle for transportation is to move around in public space in your own living environment. And bicycle lessons, they open up the opportunity for women with all backgrounds to start to occupy a space that for them does not naturally feel like they can belong there. Many women are taught to being ashamed of their bodies, to stick to the private space as much as possible, and to being as invisible as possible when in public space, to not make their own decisions and to not choose their own direction. Bicycle lessons teach women to take their space, that they have the right of way in different situations, and that they pose a danger in traffic for themselves and others if they do not take that right. They have to choose routes, they have to choose directions, and they have to get to know the city better. And it allows them also to go further away from home. These skills create a strong basis for further personal development and also uh, social engagement in their own communities. Um, yeah, I would like to thank you. And if you have questions, I will answer them uh, later in the webinar. And um, thank you. Great, thank you, Angela. Okay, thank you, Angela. Uh, if you want, you can pass, uh, the, you screen want, you can pass the screen to uh, Nutter. Uh, Nutter? And, yeah. And... Great, if you would just, there we go. Uh, OK, great. So um, our final speaker is Nader Avzalan. Uh, Nader is a visiting professor of geodesign at the University of Redlands in California. Uh, he serves as the past chair of the APA Technology Division and the co-chair of the APA Smart Cities and Sustainability Task Force. Nader's professional and academic interest focuses on the role of civic technologies and smart city strategies in creating more resilient and equitable communities. Nader's work has been presented at academic and professional conferences in the U.S., Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, so, Nader, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so, we hear uh, from Mary and Angela about working with marginalized communities and ways in which we can engage them. So, I'm going to look at online engagement and focusing on issues of digital divide. So, in the past 10 years or so, a lot of planning organizations have started using different types of online engagement tools and methods to engage larger number of audience and more diverse types of communities. And also in the past 10 years or so, we heard a lot about issues of digital divide um, and the fact that by using online engagement methods and processes, we we're missing some communities, especially marginalized communities or those who do not have access to internet. So uh, based on Pew Research, uh, in 2015, which is about even three years ago, 92% of U.S. 
teenagers go online daily. And also about 40% of US adults engage in civic and political activities through online networking sites. And, and, and again, we are talking about three years before. So, so right now these numbers are even higher than this. So with all of these enhancements in the use of technology and availability of technology um, to, to a larger and more diverse audience, does digital divide still exist? And the answer is yes. Um, please do not leave the webinar. I, uh, I'm going to talk about some other interesting things as well. So the question is, is digital divide related to race? Is digital divide related to income? So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about relationship between the rate of online engagement and the participants' background. So for example, do we see more online engagement in white neighborhoods? Do we see more online engagement in more affluent communities? And I'm going to also talk about the strategies for equitable online engagement. When you are using online engagement tools and methods and processes, how you can make those processes more equitable. I'm going to talk about a particular research uh, that I did, which was focused on Chicago bike share planning. And uh, CDOT, a couple of years ago, did use a civic engagement technology, which is a kind of online mapping tool to ask people a very simple question. Where do you want to have a bike share station? So they use a kind of online mapping technology to engage um, uh, people in the city of Chicago to answer this question about bike share stations. So people were able to uh, locate a point on a map and say, I like this location. They needed to provide their name, their email address, the location of residence, um, especially their zip code. And also they were able to explain why they like this location. Um, the, the engagement process is done. That's over. The plan is implemented. And, and the good news is that you can use bike share system in Chicago right now. It's been um, used by a large number of people. It's actually pretty active and popular. You can go and look at Divi's website. Um, if you just search for Divi um, uh, Chicago, you can get to the website and you can get all the information you need about what kind of people are using and about and also about the rates that people are using these kinds of um, new transportation modes. It's interesting to see that um, the locations that suggested by people online correlate with the locations that are actually the location of the stations that are actually implemented. So online suggestions pretty much correlated with uh, the implemented station. So basically we can kind of say that um, uh, CDOT used people's online comments in implementing uh, these, um, these bike share stations all around Chicago. But the thing is that who participated online? Do we know about this? So I looked at a particular stage of uh, the online engagement process, and based on that, about 1,400 people participated. 45% were male, 33% were female, and we do not know much about uh, the rest of the rest of them. Um, People were interested in using bike share system for shopping purposes, about 25% talked about that. People were interested in using bike share stations for work or school, about one third of participants talked about that. And it's also interesting to see that people interested in using bike share systems just for fun, about 40% of people talked about this. The participants were from various socioeconomic background. So the question is that, is the online engagement associated with their socioeconomic background? Again, so I'm referring back to my earlier question. Does race or ethnicity matter here? What about diversity index? What about education? What about income? What about unemployment rate? So for example, do we see more uh, participation from neighborhoods that are well educated comparing to the other neighborhoods? Does income matter? Do we see more, uh, more participation in more affluent communities or not? So I answered these kinds of questions based on a particular case that I just talked about, which is about city of Chicago. I did the whole analysis, all the statistical analysis, 
And as a result, it shows that some of these factors are important. So for example, online engagement is positively associated with wide population, population density, and education. Uh, more online participation, we can see that in, in white neighborhoods. We can also see more online participation in well-educated neighborhoods comparing to the other neighborhoods. But some other factors are not important. So for example, well, some other factors are negatively associated with participation. So for example, uh, in black neighborhoods, and in this case, we're talking about zip codes, in black zip codes in the city of Chicago, we see a lower online participation. Also, there is negative correlation between unemployment and online participation. And it's also interesting to see that income and Hispanic population does not matter. Again, we are looking at the city of Chicago here for this study. So based on this study, median household income was not associated with the online participation. Um, at least in the, in the case of Chicago, and I can imagine in the case of a lot of other cities, income may not matter as much as before when we are talking about online participation. So based on this study and several other case studies I've done before, I'm going to talk about four considerations for equitable online engagement. The first one is that we need to consider digital literacy still. Uh, Mary talked about LEP, uh, Angela talked about language barriers as well. These, these issues are very important. So maybe we can think about like even like issues like age or level of education instead of income. I mean, income still matters. We're talking about the US context in urban areas. Income still matters, but maybe that's not as important as age or level of education or some other variables that I uh, just talked about. Um, I think many of us have experienced something like this uh, uh, when, when we are uh, working with uh, our younger colleagues or, for example, in my case, I'm working with my students and I'm totally, uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to see how comfortable my young students are with uh, using new technologies and online media. So that's, that's fascinating. We have experienced probably something like this when we are hanging out with our kids as well. It's very easy for them to, to use these kinds of mediums and technologies. I'm not advocating for online technology per se here. I'm just saying that um, some of the factors we've been considering before, like income, may not matter as much as before. Second, we need to explore the socioeconomic profile of the participants. We should not allow anonymous participation. Um, some of our colleagues uh, are using uh, 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 technologies that allow people to, to participate without providing any background information. And, and using these technologies is fascinating uh, for them because they can get a lot of responses from a lot of people. But the problem is that if we do not know who is participating, I'm not sure if we can think about an equitable participation. I'm not sure if we can rely on that data. We need to know, we need to know about the people who have used our online media. Third, we need to analyze our engagement process. Do you need other engagement methods? If you ask me this question maybe like two years ago, I would say that, oh yes, if you're using online technology, you definitely need to focus on using face-to-face uh, -face public participatory methods and those kinds of things as well. At this moment, I think it depends on the context. Maybe if your audience is, is about American youth who can speak English and you can use an easy to use technology, maybe that can be your main media. We can still use other types of methods, including face-to-face uh, -face meetings and um, public sessions or um, other types of methods we've been using before. But this kind of engagement method, which is like about like online engagement, may be the main method that we will be using. Again, it depends on the context as well. Fourth, we need to go where people are. Um, 
instead of asking them to join our online uh, tools or our online forums, maybe we can just go where they are. Uh, there are uh, online neighborhood forums such as Nextdoor um, that are about online groups that are created for neighbors to discuss different social activities. So we as planners can join those kinds of communities and start engaging them for a variety of purposes. As the main takeaway, again, I think it's very important to evaluate our context and think about our participation strategy, thinking about language barrier issues, thinking about um, age, um, thinking about other socioeconomic factors, and then think about our participation strategy. Our cities are getting data obese, I think. We are, with, with all the focus on um, smart technologies and with the old conversation we are having about smart cities, we're using all of these sensors and all of these different methods to gather data from citizens. Um, it's good to have data. It's, it's great to have access to this huge databases, but the thing is that we need to know who represents these data in order to think about an equitable planning process. Before I wrap up my talk, I have, a, have an interesting announcement. Um, in the technology division, we are having a smart cities contest. Uh, as part of this smart city contest, we are asking for proposals. The deadline for proposals is about 10 days from now. It's January the 29th. Uh, we are interested in hearing from you whether you are working um, in a very large organization or in a small nonprofit. We are going to evaluate proposals based on um, your capabilities. We're looking for uh, projects that are about the use of different types of technologies in planning and design. And those projects should be applied and at least should you should be done um, by the first or second stage of your project. So you should, you should have done something to show us. But the deadline is about 10 days from now. Um, if you are interested, uh, just search for Technology Division Smart Cities Awards. You can um, send me an email if you have question about this or if you have any comments, or you can also uh, send your questions to Michelle and Tom. Their information is online as well. With that said, Thank you very much. I'm going to hand this over to Mary. OK, thank you, Nader. Uh, before wrapping up uh, today's webinar, uh, I would like to thank planning communities, APA sustainable communities, and APA technology division for their sponsorship and support for today's webinars. We are looking forward to receive your feedback after Q&A. Please feel free to contact me or Jennifer for any question related to this webinar or upcoming webinars. Before the Q&A, I would like to share um, key takeaways from today's webinar, which can be used by any planners in public engagement phase. So what we learned today was that religious affiliation is an influential cultural characteristic uh, which can push a community to the margin and, can, and should be considered by urban planner in any project that um, has religious minorities involved. We learned that planners should know about socioeconomic background of the online participant. We also knew that um, know that our cities are data always and we should know who this data represents. And um, through an example from bicycling letter lessons from Dutch social setting, we learned that promoting active transportation works as a means for per personal development and also social engagement for underrepresented population and immigrant specifically. Besides these lessons, we, are, we were supposed to have Jenna with us from AARP, but unfortunately, uh, due to health issues, she was not able to join us. We hope to have her in future webinars and learn more about effective tools and techniques to engage elderly population in planning processes. This webinar 
um, was the first webinar of the APA series of webcast on social sustainability in transportation planning. This first webcast gave us an opportunity to talk with you about effective methods and tools for social engagement. Three other webinars of this series will be held in 2018 and also early 2019. Please stay tuned uh, as the themes and speakers of the second webinars will be announced in March, in early March. Thank you very much for being with us and we, we are looking forward to see you all in the next webinar. But before that, we are looking forward to see you at APA National Conference in April. By this, I pass it to Christine for Q&A. Thank you, Christine. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so folks, you can go ahead and um, type your questions in the chat box. Please let me know who you'd like uh, to answer the question if possible. Um, the first one uh, is for Angela. There are a good half a dozen questions related to this. Um, can we talk about uh, the, I guess, lack of bicycle helmets in um, your discussion about uh, bicycling in, in the Netherlands? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I, I regularly, well, most presentations I do abroad, I uh, people ask me about helmets. Um, and sometimes I assume that, that people know the Dutch take on helmets, but uh, I guess it's, it's not the case. Um, in the Netherlands, it is not, um, the norm to wear a helmet, especially not as an adult. It is the norm to not wear a helmet uh, unless you're a race cyclist or a mountain biker. Um, but for your daily transportation on your sturdy granny bike, that is, you know, your upright bikes and with your bags and with your children, um, the norm is to not use, well, to, you know, have, um, to feel safe. Um, of course, uh, in our cities, this, this space for cyclists is relatively safe. Um, the speeds of the cars are low. We have dedicated bike paths and, and you know, a lot of 30 kilometer zones. So the safety is not so much on, on the person, but much more on the transportation system that is made safe for everyone. So you do not have to protect yourself uh, in a similar way. I, I hope that that answers the question. Thank you. Um, next one is, uh, let's see, let's go to Nader. For the bike share location investigation, did the location of a large university nearby skew your results in any way? Thanks for the question, um, Jenny. It actually did not. Uh, we had a pretty normalized distribution uh, of suggested locations all over uh, all over the city. And also, it's interesting to see that some of the suggested locations um, were uh, were in neighborhoods uh, far from downtown, and also some neighborhoods that the city of Chicago was not even sure. Um, about citizens' interests. So, so um, based on my recent, uh, based on based on the research, uh, yeah, the, the location it was it was from almost all over. Okay, we're going to stick with you. Um, why is ADA compliance of online engagement tools not part of the equitable online engagement discussion? So. Uh, there, there is not much um, regulation about online engagement. Um, even if you look at AICP code of ethics, you, do, you, you, you won't find a lot of um, a lot of strategies and a lot of uh, discussions and ideas about 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 regulations that you need to consider or about ethical concerns you need to consider about online engagement as an urban planner. At the a, at the APA, uh, we are. Um, we are actually working on that topic and we are adding to not the ADA's compliance but per se, but basically um, adding uh, 
uh, strategies and also considerations in the AICP Code of Ethics uh, just to understand and help planners uh, think about ways in which they can use these technologies more in a more equitable way and also more effectively. I hope I answered that question. Thank you. Um, next one. Does anyone on the panel have any insights into engagement with Native American communities? Civic engagement is part of uh, my research. Uh, I have not done uh, research on this particular topic, but for this particular case study, the case study of Chicago, I looked at Native American communities and I did not find a correlation between online engagement and Native Americans. So for that particular research, and that's actually the only research I, I looked at this topic, it's, it's a super important topic and I think um, we need to look at that in more detail. But in that particular research, we did not find any correlation between uh, Native American neighborhoods and, um, and, and the rate of online engagement. Okay. Um, I also work oh, go with, ahead. Hi, I also go, um, work with Native American when I was working in the Detroit metro area, but it was Native American Muslims. And I haven't found any difference between their um, walking behavior and social life behavior um, with other Muslim women that I studied in the area. Thank you. Um, for the Chicago example, how was participation in the survey promoted? I did not. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I did not do a survey. I actually used um, the data collected uh, through uh, through the technology itself. I um, the city of Chicago, but um, if 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 you're referring to the online engagement tool as the survey, the city of Chicago used a variety of different methods to let people know about the online engagement activities. They had posters. They put it on their website. They introduced uh, the uh, the tool and the whole engagement process through their face-to-face -face meetings. So they tried so many different channels to make sure that a lot of people know about it. I do not know about the details of um, the timing. For example, did they spend like about one or two months before starting the engagement process to let people know about it or they, they did it for like two weeks or so. That's, that's an important consideration, but just to make it short, um, City of Chicago used variety of online and non-online methods to let people know about the technology itself. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. What outreach is recommended for tourism-based resort communities? How do you reach out to visitors on planning-related issues? This is for anyone. I can jump in. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, and I think online engagement technologies can be very valuable to respond to, to that. Uh, I worked on several projects in Colorado where they use online engagement methods to engage tourists uh, in, in the planning process. And it was good for them because tourists are come they come and go, right? They, they're not, they're, they don't live in the town. And even when they are in town, there are a lot of other things to do. So it's very, very, very hard to engage them um, in, a, in a public meeting. So they were using these kinds of online tools at the time. Um, for example, I know they used Mind Mixer for several projects um, and, and Mind Mixer was used in a couple of different small resort towns in Colorado. Um, and it was pretty helpful because uh, it allowed people to go home and then participate at the time that, that they want. So they didn't, they didn't need to be there or living there in that city in order to, to, to engage. So I think online, online methods in particular can be very valuable for that purpose. Thank you. 
Next question. Uh, we're going to head back to Angela. How do head injuries compare in the U.S. versus the Netherlands? I think we're back to the bicycle helmet question again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't have a, a graph or something or exact numbers on, on head injuries. Um, generally, I can say that um, cycling uh, incidents and fatalities are much lower uh, in the Netherlands compared to uh, North America, uh, to many countries in the world, uh, actually. Uh, we're one of the safest countries in the world uh, to be in traffic. We have the highest rate of people on bikes. Um, so it is, uh, it is absolutely not as much uh, an issue over here with the helmets as it is in in other countries and and i was also thinking a bit more about it like okay how to you know how to respond but the the dutch approach is much more to prevent falling uh rather than um uh, focus only on oh in the case you fall uh you have to protect your head um yeah so to go back to to these numbers so the number of people with head injuries is very low uh, and much lower than North American numbers. Thanks. Uh, Mary, you're up. Uh, is your research available for further review? Uh, is it a question for me? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, it will be available in um, after March. And also a part of it will be published till the end of this year. I will be more than happy to share it with all audiences of this webinar. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next question. All right, can someone uh, recommend which demographic information um, you think should be required from survey participants? So it's at it's I, I think it's a totally depend on what kind of participant you have um, like if you are working with immigrants newly immigrated people and the demographic information that you need is completely different from while you're working with um, rational ethnic minorities who has been living in a city or a country for so while so I don't think that I can find a unique answer for this question because it's, it's really different because we, we design a, a questionnaire or a survey based on the community that we are studying. And to add to what Mary just said, um, as urban planners, our obligation is to serve the public. So we're responding to public interest, which means that we should try to um, respond to a diverse community that we are serving in that city. So. Uh, yes, it depends on the community, but it should be as diverse as possible. Thank you. Uh, next question. This is a good one. How would you recommend, this is for anyone, designing uh, socio-demographic questions in a way that does not discourage participants in online engagement technology? I, I can yeah, go ahead, Mary. No, I can you repeat the question, please? Sure. How would you recommend designing socio demographic questions in a way that does not discourage participation in online engagement technologies? So um, I, I can jump in and um, so first of all, I think uh, one of the good things about online engagement is that um, it might make it a little bit easier for um, marginalized communities and and also new immigrants to participate because uh, they may feel more comfortable using these kinds of tools uh, instead of going to a public meeting. So. So just, I just want to add to this because um, it's important to the question of what kind of questions we can ask. 
I think in general, people feel more comfortable when they are using online technologies uh, to answer different types of questions uh, compared to face-to-face -face ones. My, my point is that I think, I think we should know about people's background. So the kind of questions we're going to ask are, well, we're talking about two different types of questions. One question is about um, the questions about the survey, like people's interest about what we're going to do with this part of town, and also the kind of questions we're asking people about their background. So people are not comfortable with talking, talking about their income, but they are, they are comfortable with talking about their income range. Um, they are pretty comfortable with talking about age, their zip code, and some of these, these, these variables. Um, and as long as we are asking for their name, it can be even their first name. We are just, we are just trying to push them to spend some time to provide information about themselves. I have realized that some people do not provide their full name, and that's, I think, totally fine. Maybe they just put two words for the last name, and that's totally fine. But they are, they are more comfortable with talking about some other issues, like their age range, their income range, the zip code of the place they're living, and those kinds of things. I think that would be, that would be very valuable. Um, to follow I, up with that, oh, go ahead. Before uh, go, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, I was. Um, I can also imagine that um, if you uh, give people the opportunity to um, do the online engagement, um, not only in English but also in other languages in. In the you know the you may have an idea of which other native languages people speak um, that may appeal to people to participate in in a way that is more meaningful for them. Although I'm I'm not sure about the U.S., but in the Netherlands it is um, at the moment very politically sensitive to suggest something uh, like this because there is a tendency to feel that everyone should you know speak and write uh, fluent Dutch. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other, yeah, go ahead, Mary. Uh, so the other thing that I want to um, mention is that using uh, open-ended questions instead of having uh, like different uh, questions with different choices, because like using open-ended questions, specifically when you are working with you know, underrepresented population uh, give them an opportunity to share their stories with you in their own languages. And they fully share so many things that you never thought that they, they would share with you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just to add to something that Angela and also Mary mentioned. So, um, so in the U.S., uh, some cities like, for example, city of Los Angeles sometimes send out uh, surveys in Hispanic. So, um, and in Spanish, so that so that Hispanic population feel more comfortable with engagement as well. But I think most of the engagement processes are happening in English, so that's an issue. Great, great point about language barrier. Um, and also, just to add something about what Mary said about open-ended questions. I think open-ended questions are great. Uh, they they provide, infra they provide an opportunity for people to to write in a more comfortable way and express their ideas without feeling that they are limited. Um, on the other hand, we should make sure that uh, we know how to analyze that data that we are receiving. So if like 5,000 people make comments, uh, it might be a little bit time consuming and hard to go through all of those comments as well. So, so I would say combination of open-ended and closed-ended questions um, and thinking about ways in which we can we are going to analyze this the huge data that we are collecting excellent point about the data set and how you can take something qualitative and turn it into something quantitative for uh, results going along with that question how how do you take into account the uh, set of folks that don't have access to online applications either they you know they just are an older population perhaps that uh, don't have any interest in the internet or they just don't have access to it. How do you take into account um, their opinions? Um, I, I, can, I can 
jump in. Um, so of course we need to use a variety of different methods as I, as I mentioned during my talk. Um, and online engagement would be one of those methods. Um, but j just to let you know, in, in part of a research that I did three years ago, I got comments from a homeless guy uh, who was um, participating in the planning process while sitting in a coffee shop, and I guess he was in, in a Starbucks. So um, I think the demographics of people who are using these kinds of technologies is changing, um, but, but of course we need to use a variety of uh, different, different methods to make sure that we are engaging a diverse community. And the other thing that I would like to mention is that having a participant observation through social media. Um, like for my study, I was a member of a few closed Facebook groups and I had conversation with Muslim women before starting the field work. And I, I, we had conversation in Arabic and they were comfortably share so many things about the question that I asked from them in those closed Facebook groups which I don't think that they would, they would share it with me in face-to-face -face conversation. Um, thank you. Next question. Let's head back to Angela. Um, have you noticed any occupations or industries that correlate to higher bike use? I guess this could be for anyone too, but let's just start with you, Angela. Sorry. Can you repeat it? I didn't hear it very well. It seems I'm far away. <laughs> okay. Um, have you noticed any occupations or industries that correlate to higher bike use? That correlate what? To higher bike use, bicycle use? Um... So higher bike use after after bicycle courses. Um, let me repeat it again. Um, are there the, uh, are there any occupations or industries that correlate to higher bike use? Um, like like okay. No, it's I don't. I've never heard of, of, of anything like that. I mean, it is the case that um, especially higher educated women uh, have a high level of, of cycling and lower educated men, um, but not necessarily linked to any sort of uh, type of occupation. Mm -hmm. And can I add something, Jenny, to this? Oh, go right ahead. Um, so based on a research I did in Cincinnati about bike share station, um, a lot of online engagements regarding to the location of bike share stations, they're very close to restaurants, cafes, and bar, and also in the downtown Cincinnati, and also close to the University of Cincinnati. So I think it depends on the case. So. University of Cincinnati is attracting a lot of students, which means it's, it, yeah, so so a lot of people like to have bike share stations close to that, and there are a lot of bike users around it. But in general, uh, cafes and restaurants and bars are, it seems that they are very attractive for, for people to have bike share stations nearby. And of course, um, uh, transit stations would be another thing. Thank you. Um, let's see, next question back to Angela. Um, but again, this could be for, for anyone. Um, in the US, I've heard and read from many folks of color and differential citizenship immigration status that they're worried about riding a bicycle for transport because it opens them up to increased targeting by police. Um, how do we account for these concerns when designing cycling infrastructure and other non-motorized transportation public space? Yeah, so um, I, I am aware of, of uh, some issues happening 
well, and people being worried in in North America, and also the um, the worries on on Vision Zero ideas that you know in which enforcement is also one of the um, important factors, and then Vision Zero, or in in the Dutch system, it's called sustainable safety. Um, is not meant, you know, it is it is meant um, for real traffic um, violations and not to uh, police people of color or people who look different, um, you know, and, and find a way to, to punish them. Um, I think it is a, uh, yeah, it is a mix of a society that is not equitable and then a transportation system if you want to change that in in that kind of society you have to be aware of of the issues and i guess the most important thing is to have an open conversation um you know being aware is a huge step uh, and then yeah hopefully those conversations can also leverage, uh, you know, wider systemic changes uh, that are needed if you want uh, public spaces that are um, open for everyone. Thank you. Um, I think we'll, we have time for one more question, um, and this can be for anyone, but let's again start with Angela. What measures should be taken to make spaces safer for women to be encouraged to ride a bicycle? And I think we could say that it doesn't necessarily have to be just women, um, but just for anyone uh, to be encouraged to ride a bicycle. What steps can we take to make spaces safer? Yeah, I think um, many, many people focus on um things like separated bicycle paths and and a good network so you go out of your home and it is safe there to ride and then up until your final destination it's still safe there and you can lock your bike in a in a safe manner um i think that is a really uh, important thing that that planners you know in which planners play a really important role um, but I think that that this works best if you combine it with attention for um, you know taking into account that not everybody may feel uh, safe you know from within to being on a bicycle and to being in public space. Um, so working with people. Um, having them try things and, and also uh, making sure that the bicycles that are available in the area are suitable uh, for as many people as possible. It can be an issue that women, you know, especially women from, from certain areas in the world are very short and they have very short legs. And for them, it can be really hard in, for instance, if you're working with bike share systems that they may not fit on that bicycle or they want to, they need to uh, transport their children. So how are you going to do that? Um, so the, the social factors uh, in combination with the safe space, um, I think is important. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple folks uh, type in. Thank you for doing so. At the bottom of your screen, um, it shows where the webinar recording slides are at. And again, that's on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And just below it, it looks like there's a little bit of a typo. It's sustainableplanning.net. Um, make sure you add another N in there. Um, switch the Thank N you. In the <laughs> um, so I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up now. This was a wonderful conversation, um, and it was nice to have such a great array of uh, panelists. Um, so thank you to the Sustainable Communities Division and um, 
the Technology Division, for sponsoring today's webcast and for our panelists for joining us from literally uh, all over the world. Uh, we appreciate your time and your thought. Um, and if your question was not answered, feel free to reach out to a specific panelist for further discussion. Um, again, this will be posted on our webcast webpage uh, as a PDF, and we'll get a copy of this presentation up on our YouTube channel shortly. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, have a great weekend. We'll talk next time. Bye-bye.